go. All right, so my name is Andy James. I am a senior solutions engineer for HashiCorp. Today we're going to walk, talk about Terraform, CentOS, and Amazon. You can replace Amazon with any cloud. It's just the easiest one to teach really quickly. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I obviously work sales now, and I obviously work for HashiCorp. I am not going to talk about enterprise or any of the enterprise sales stuff. My goal here is not to be a sales guy. It's to talk about all the open source stuff and all the stuff you guys can do for free right now and run big companies for. The reason I want to mention that is that anything that we consider a salesy or an enterprisey stuff is purely for true enterprise companies. So think like your small businesses, think things you want to do on your own projects and stuff. Everything that open source offers is the core features of all of our products. We do not keep anything from you. So everything I will show you is all open source. This is all stuff that a community builds together. So, but I just want to be sort of transparent that we have two sets of offerings and that I technically, for a living, get paid to sell the other one. I will not talk about it. Prior to that, I worked for, as technically for iHeartMedia, so I used to run 850 radio stations across the United States. Um, before that, I ran Vox Media, and before that, I was one of the senior engineers over the entire Rackspace infrastructure. So, used to do this for a living, loved doing it. Um, prior to that, I was at HostGator. That was my first job ever. It was really great. Um, $10, $10 a month gets you hosting, which is fantastic. You would not believe how many porn sites run on this game. Oh, <laughs> so, company overview, a little bit about who we are. So, HashiCorp, you may or may not have ever heard of, but you've probably heard of at least one of the six products that we make. We make a product called Nomad, which is a scheduler. It's sort of a Kubernetes, only it's single binary, easy to use. Console, which is a service meshing tool. So, it has service discovery, service meshing, so you can do DNS service discovery. You can also do what we call also Connect, which is now an open source product, which lets you do TLS communication between services. Um, Terraform, obviously, which is infrastructure as code, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail today. Vault, which is a what we consider a secret management tool. What it, what's unique about Vault, all of this again, open source. Um, what's unique about Vault is that it is for dynamic secrets. So imagine you've got a SQL database. Your application can talk to Vault, get a dynamically generated credential, access the database, do what it needs to do, and that credential will then be wiped. Which means think about a business who's rotating passwords, or even yourself who's trying to secure things better. Now all your passwords and everything that you deal with is dynamic, and the only thing that has sort of a static-ish password is the tokens that you use to talk to the vault. Um, it makes managing passwords easier for you. Um, from there we go into Packer. So Packer is one of our first tools that we ever made. Packer is designed to build sort of images for anything. So you can build AMIs for Amazon, or or let's say VMware images, or maybe we need to make Docker containers. So, doc, so the point of Packer is that you can sort of give it a set of instructions and say, I need an image that has all of this stuff. It runs on CentOS. It needs to have all of its Sys compliance stuff in it. Blah, 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 blah. Give it all to the Packer. Packer will go build it and then output it in whatever format you need. What's really nice about Packer is that, let's say you are a company running in multiple clouds. You can use Packer, have your standard image. Packer can output it so that you have a working image for all of the different ways that every single cloud does things. Again, this is all open source. Last but not least is Vagrant. Vagrant was our very first product. Vagrant sort of an interesting story. Vagrant was built by Mitchell Hashimoto, which is our founder, literally because he was a consultant, and he got really tired of reformatting his laptop every single customer. So what he did is built Vagrant, and Vagrant allows you to build an entire working copy of your, of your infrastructure, whatever infrastructure you want, so let's say, two web servers and a MySQL server, three VMs. You can give it a simple, it's called a Vagrant file, you give it a simple config file, put it into Vagrant, Vagrant will go out and build all the servers, it'll do all the networking for you, and it'll run it all run on your laptop so that you can actually do dev work work in your <coughs> environment, and then tear it all down, rebuild it, whatever you need to do, it's all really easy to use. That's the point of those products. So that's a very quick overview, I know that was really fast, but that's sort of what the six products are. Um, I want to really, really quickly go over the cloud landscape just so you understand what HashiCorp sort of believes in and why we built all these products. So this is just a small spattering of what the cloud environment works like. In the static world, obviously, most people are using either dedicated servers or VMware. So you've got your vSphere, you've got deal with hardware, you've got IP communications all hardware, it's all vCenter. As we obviously went into the dynamic world where we start actually off here with the word cloud all the time, which just means someone else is hosting your servers. Um, you started dealing with everyone coming up with their own technologies for how to deploy applications, network them together, secure them, provision them. So you've got, in the provisioning layer, as a good example, 
You've got confirmation, you have um, ARM templates at Azure, GCP has Cloud Deployment Manager. When you get into things like DigitalOcean, they don't have anything. You've got a nice API to use. Like, everybody sort of has their own way to do things. Um, and we, we think this is ridiculous because as you get into the IT world, or for those of you who are clearly in the IT world, like, if you have to learn every single one of these boxes technologies, they're all unique, they're all different, this is exhausting. Um, so we really wanted to figure out how do we make this life better for everyone who has to live in it. Um, and that's where we come in. So what we did is we said, let's build a stack of tools that cover the four major things, so that's operational security, networking, and deployment, and whether you're deploying on-prem, on servers in your own data center, or in the cloud, it should be easy to do, and it should always be done the same way. So the whole idea here is you're networking through console, doesn't matter which data center you're in, doesn't matter what cloud you're in, console's a single binary, you throw it on your servers, it handles all your networking for you. Uh, Terraform, which is the infrastructure's code, which we'll talk about in a second, like, doesn't matter where you're deploying servers and how many servers you need and what they look like, you, you will write the code the same way every time, no matter what cloud it's in. And that's sort of the, sort of our common cloud delivery model. So a little bit about Terraform, and that, then we'll get actually talking about the fun part and the technical stuff. A little bit about Terraform, so we, we built the product in 2014. Um, we have 1,200 plus contributors right now on the open source community, so thank you to anyone who already does, but if you don't, feel free to. Um, we have 200 plus providers. The Terraform provider is something that you can talk to. All it is is a translation, translation layer from HCL, which is the HashiCorp language, to something. So let's say the Amazon API. The Azure API, maybe New Relic, maybe yeah. Kubernetes. Uh, my favorite one of all, Dominus. If you want to write it, if you want to order Dominus, you can write your own Terraform code and hit submit, God. and it will buy your pizza for you. Fantastic. <laughs> well, this is what I mean. If it has an API that it can be scripted against, you can build a provider and let Terraform handle it. Um, obviously, we have over seventeen thousand stars, and we can get over hundred thousand downloads every week on the software. It's all open source software, you enjoy it. So, let's talk about Terraform. Let's talk about what it's like to provision in Amazon. So, when you division, when you, when you division, when you provision a VM on Amazon, you obviously have first option is the UI. Now, UI is nice, it's point and click. I like point and click, I work in sales. Um, but the reality is, this is annoying, and this is not real estate. And if you need to build 100 servers, and then another 100 tomorrow, you'll hate your life. The other thing is that with the UI, it doesn't remember anything. So you have to remember every single thing every time you do this. So Amazon realized how ridiculous that was, and they built something called CloudFormation. CloudFormation is really cool. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It is an infrastructure as code tool. I actually have no problems with it. Um, it's written in JSON, so as you can see, it's pretty easy to read and understand what it's doing. This, this as an example, is building an EC2 instance. So pretty straightforward. Or, you can use Terraform. This also builds an EC2 instance in about a half as much code. It's also easy to read. So Terraform is written with the thought process that as developers, as DevOps engineers, as sysadmins, you either have the development background and understand code, or you're like a sysadmin, <laughs> don't really understand code, nor do you have any interest in learning code. So we really wanted to build something that was human, reasonable, easy to explain, easy to understand, so that you can still take advantage of this in your day-to-day -day life, but not have to feel like you're going and learning Python from scratch or something like that. So Terraform is executable documentation. That's what we like to call it, because it's easy to read. It's obviously human readable, so you can tell that we're building a virtual instance. It's probably going to be a web server. It's using whatever AMI, which is Amazon's equivalent of an image, what security groups, which is the equivalent of their firewall, and what the instance is. So like. What size server do you need? So this is all designed to be incredibly easy to understand, and anyone who looks at this can understand what they're looking at. What's also nice is that you can test this in advance, which we'll go over with a cool cool little tool in Terraform called Plan, and what it does is essentially a dry run of what it's going to do. Um, and then obviously it works with all major cloud providers, which you covered. In short, we like to call it infrastructure as code. <clears throat> so Infrastructure as code it allows you to codify your workspace. So your workflow is now a simple piece of code instead of this complex point and click and learning all these different things and just write a chunk of code and deploy it. Um, it also lets you update and change existing hardware. So where this becomes really interesting is in the market, state is king. 
when you think about, so without naming names, there's another, there's another <coughs> provider out there who also does infrastructure. But the difference with them is that they're able to build out the VMs and they do it really well. But when you, they'll say build five VMs, they'll build you five VMs. Now if you say I need only, now I need six VMs, this other tool will build you six more. Where Terraform will say, oh, you already have five, here's your six. So be aware that if the tool doesn't use state, you have to manage your state yourself. So this is the value of Terraform, is that it allows you to change and update your existing infrastructure because it understands what your infrastructure is already. Um, as we talked about, it has Terraform Planner, which lets you do dry runs. Um, it lets you tie it right into your CID city workflows. So let's say you're doing a Docker deployment container, but you want to make sure the Kubernetes cluster is actually running before you deploy the infrastructure. Um, you can have your pipeline do a Terraform run and make sure that the, code, the infrastructure exists and then deploy your container. Tie it right into your pipeline so that it's just part of your development workflow. Um, it also allows you to do modulin. So modulin is sort of a reusable chunks of Terraform, just like most modules and most things. Um, and you can tie them and use them in multiple projects. You can throw them in a GitHub repo and source them into any sort of Terraform project you want. Um, there's also a public modules registry where you can go get modules for just about anything you can think of. And the all you need here is to make it really quick to write code as you need. Um, and then last but not least, it enables collaboration. Because your Terraform is sort of code, now you're able to throw it into GitHub and do PRs, or you're able to you know, share it between your other developers and make sure that they can all sort of work in the code, see what the infrastructure is doing uh, really easily. Um, so other infrastructure is code tools. Um, we've got, obviously, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, theoretically, Bash, and PowerShell, I would argue. but. It's in the picture, I could just copy and paste in the picture. <laughs> yeah, I at least work to the technical field and understand the difference. <laughs> um, the reality is these are all fantastic tools. Um, these tools are designed to run your infrastructure after it's deployed. Some of them have some sort of like infrastructure deployment built in that sort of got tacked on after Terraform got built. But in general, these tools are fantastic for managing your configs, managing your, or, like, your orchestration, handling config drift, all of those things that you need, this stuff, use that. Um, we actually have built a lot of what we call provisioners, and what a provisioner is, um, and we'll talk, I'll show you those in a minute, but a provisioner essentially is, once the Terraform has finished running, then go run some other tool, is what it tells Terraform. So like there's a provisioner for Chef, and for Puppet, and for Ansible, and for PowerShell, and for Bash. So that no matter what you may need to write and whatever you need to happen on the server next, you can simply put it into Terraform and say, hey Terraform, your dot, you've already run, now I need you to run this Ansible playbook, and it will go run that on the server it just built. So that's that's that. But these, these tools very much are designed for handling the server once it's built, not so much for building the servers. So let's actually talk about Terraform. So Terraform writes is in its own language. So with all, with all sort of the things on the market, you can either deal with JSON and the wonderful malformed JSON world, or the misidentified YAML world, or go back to next, nested XML. All of these are options. So we are not a huge fan of any of the above because we also like to get things done quickly and efficiently. Um, so we actually wrote our own. HCL is our own language. It is entirely unique. Sort of a hybrid between all of them, if you want the truth, but it's our own language. Um, that doesn't deal with any of these weird problems. So let's take a look at CloudFormation since we're talking about Amazon. So all we're doing here is taking the words, the, the variable pilot server name, and adding a three to the end. With, J, with, with the JSON through CloudFormation, it's an FN join, tell what the limiter is, and it takes care of it. And you'll end up with variable three. Nice and easy. With Terraform, we think that's actually even as easy as that is, it's still too hard. So what we do is say, call the variable, put a three in the end. All done, nice and easy. Again, the whole point of this was to really thinking towards like, what is it, what are you, what is a DevOps person doing? What is a sys engineer doing? Like, they're, they're not trying to learn JSON, they're just trying to get the job done. So we wanted to make this, make as simple and as easy to understand as possible. Okay, so in Terraform there are three files. There are only three files you care about. There's the main file, which we call main TF. Inside main TF is going to be what resources you are building. So, 
Resources is a new term. In Terraform, a resource is something that you are making. That resource could be a pizza with Domino's. That resource could be an EC2 instance with Amazon. Something you need to make is a resource. So every provider, which is all the actual API layer sort of transition tools, so every provider like Amazon, will have a big group of resources underneath of things you can make within that provider. So in this case, we're building a VPC and a subnet. This is sort of what the code would look like to build those. This is actual functional code, just so that you guys are aware. This is actually how easy it is to build a VPC and a subnet in Amazon using Terraform. The next file is the variables file. So in Terraform, you must actually define every variable you may or may not use and set defaults if they need them. So in this case, we're setting a variable called prefix, the one called region, one called address space. We can now use those in our main TF and pull them in, and I think, so, so let's take a region for address space, for, a, for example. If you'll see the cider block at the, bot, at the top says var address space, it's going to read the variables file and pull in the 10.0.0.0.16. So it's, the whole point of it is to make it really easy for you to variableize out, which means now you can make modules, things that you can share amongst other pieces of code or use all over the place, and just set a set of variables. Now what's important is you'll notice that while two of these three have defaults, one does not. In the case that you do not set a default, Terraform will give you two options. One, you can create a different file called the, the variables.tfvars file and set the actual unique variables for that application. Or, when you run Terraform, it will pop up and actually ask you to input them manually. So anything it doesn't know, it's not going to error because it doesn't know, it's going to ask you for the answers. The last and third final file is the outputs file. So, the outputs file is literally just going to output back to the command line whatever you ask for. So in this case, we're looking for a vault server and a MySQL FQDM. It will output that information for us so that we can see what, whatever we need. This is very useful when you think you're building something like an EC2 instance in Amazon. When you do that, when I'm actually going to show you guys live in a minute, you build a VPC, an internet gateway, a route, subnets, security groups, and then you can build an EC2 instance. There's a process. Well, that's okay, but the reality is all you care about is the EC2 instance IP. So what you can do here is program your outputs to only show you the IPs you care about, so it'll run all the code, output what you're looking for. Um, this is especially useful if you're thinking about like a pipeline or something. You start doing sort of dev work and you're using Jenkins or something. You can now pull that output into something else without having to parse through all of this junk that Terraform throws out otherwise. So a resource we talked about a little, but I want to sort of very quickly touch on it uh, a little more detail. So Terraform has resources. They're structured the same way no matter what provider they come from. The resource is always going to be a type. The type is going to be whatever it is that you are building. So for Amazon, this is like EC2 instance, or it's, uh, or I think they call it AWS instance actually, or it, VPC for Domino's. I think it's, uh, I want to say it's order number or something. Like it, everyone's got their unique, weird, types, but it's always going to be the same thing. This is some of the thing that you can do. The next is always going to be a name. That name is unique to your Terraform. It doesn't matter what you call it, you can call it anything you want, but that will be the identifier for that resource. So if I build an EC2 instance for, web, for my web hosting, and it's going to probably run Apache or Nginx or any other modern thing, like likely I'm going to call that web server. That'll be its name. That way, anywhere else in Terraform, I need to make a call back to it. I remember it's called web server, and I can find it. Again, though, you can call it Breaking Spears. The tooling doesn't care. This is just for you. From there, you're going to enter what we call the parameters. These are literally going to be how you control everything. So every, every resource will have different parameters. Uh, so EC2 instance, obviously, is the size of the VM. It's the A and line image. It's all of that stuff. Domino's is going to be your credit card number, you know, all the fun things you and I need. So these are the parameters, um, and that's it. This is, this is every resource in Terraform. If you can remember these three things, that the type is whatever you need, the name is whatever you want to associate with, and parameters are the things that it needs to know to build what you've asked for, you can build in Terraform. This is all you actually have to learn. Cool. So, 
Now we've talked about Terraform a little, let's actually look at Terraform a little. So, let me clear this. So, first things first. This is Terraform, in a nutshell. Let me make that a little bigger. Seriously. Where is it, there it is. All right, so here's Terraform. So the very first thing you do in every Terraform run is tell it what you want to actually build with. This is what we kept talking about provider, and I've said the word provider 100,000 times and you're tired of hearing it. So, in this case, the very first thing you do is say, I'm going to talk to my provider, Amazon. They call it AWS because obviously it's Amazon Web Services. Every provider is going to have its own name, and I'll show you guys how to look them up. Keep in mind, if you can think of it, there's probably a provider for it. Um, and then, we're going to build a resource. So, in this example, we're building, everyone knows this down, type, we're building a VPC. We're going to call this VPC Andy State Company because I really like giving names that make no sense. Um, and then we're going to even assign our block. I did not use variables in this in this example because this example was designed for me to use for this. So side our block, we know what side is going to have. And then where it gets sort of unique is that in Amazon you really want to tag things or else you'll never find them again, especially in the account I'm going to build this in where we have thousands and thousands of VPCs. So tags is going to be Amazon tags. It's really easy to use that. Again, it's just a parameter. Give it tags, tell it what the names of the tags are, and close it out. This is all that would be required to build a VPC. We're going to do the same thing for Internet Gateway. What's unique about Internet Gateway, which you'll see more and more, is that what we've now done is said, I need the ID for the VPC. So what I remember is that it's a type that's called VPC. I gave it some weird name, Andy Fit Company, and I need its ID. So really straightforward, I'm now able to pull from that previous resource and use it as part of my gateway so that I can assign the gateway to the right VPC. I can do the same thing with routes, so I'm going to pull in the gateway's ID, and I'm going to pull in the default route table from my VPC, and so forth and so forth. So I can build out multiple IP ranges. Once again, I'm just pulling in the VPC ID that I used earlier. What's really nice about Terraform is it doesn't also matter what order I put all this code in. If I put the VPC in the middle of all this mess, it will still build it first. What Terraform does when you actually execute it is it takes all of your code and then it builds a map. And it will determine in what order is required to build out everything that you've asked for without error. So if you're calling for the VPC ID all over the place, it's going to put that first. Because it knows it has to build that before it can build anything else. Um, and so forth. So that, that's how Terraform thinks, is it always builds things in an order that makes sense, and it doesn't matter what order you write the code in. Um, we're going to scroll all the way down. So now we've got security groups. So this is this is the Amazon equivalent of like a hardware firewall. Um, obviously, I opened it to the world because why not? Um, <laughs> now this is where we're getting interesting, and this is actually one of my favorite little things. Um, in all the Terraform documentation, and everywhere I looked, this was really hard to find. Um, so it is, it is publicly available if you guys ever need it, and you guys decide want to play with Terraform, it's in one of my repos, and I can send the link to where. But it, Terraform has the ability to do sort of lookups for you. So in this case, I don't know the Amazon AMI for CentOS, and it's different for every, every um, region. So now I have an interesting problem where I need to build a CentOS image. I know that's what I want to use. What else would I use? But I have to go find it. Well, instead of doing that, what you can do is say, I need an Amazon AMI. <coughs> I'm going to call it CentOS because, again, that's just a name. And I know that owner 6905 blah, 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 makes it. That is the actual owner ID for the CentOS organization. So anything and everything that CentOS puts out, will be under that ID. So then what I'm able to do is do a filter and say, I'm looking for the CentOS Linux 7 image, which is this fun little filter line way up here somewhere. This. Tell it the architecture, tell it the device type we need, and it will now pull into that data the matching AMI for whatever region you are to this information. And you can use this to look for other things too, but I feel like if we're at a CentOS talk, probably should use CentOS. Um, the reality is, the CentOS one surprisingly is more difficult to find than it should be. So, if anyone does decide to play with Terraform, feel free to reach out. I'm actually on GitHub. I'm happy to give you guys 
this piece of code. <laughs> um, and then, last but not least, I'm going to build out a Docker server really quick. What's really interesting is that we've now talked about how I went and got the ID for that AMI. So now I'm able to pull in that data resource that I created and say, hey, I want the CentOS ID. It'll fill it in for me. I never have to think about it again. Um, I'm also able to pull in, these are the IPs that we made earlier. Here's the security group we made earlier. It's also going to pull in its own public and private IPs for doing its connection checking. And I'm going to give it tags. Again, all of these are just parameters. Really easy to use. Now, before I run this, let's show you guys how you see what all the parameters are. All of the Terraform documentation is very, very well done. It's not necessarily well done for all our other products, but Terraform is spot on. Um, and what's nice is there's always an example of how to use it. So in this case, I looked up, and I literally is how you see this. I Googled AWS instance Terraform. And it will take you right there. It'll always be at the top of your search. It makes your life easy. Um, it'll always give you an example. So in this case, remember, provider has to be required. Here's the AMI for that other company. And, and then we, um, we build a web server. What's also nice is it gives you a reference of every single potential argument that you could put in here. So these are all the parameters that are allowed. AMI is required. Most are optional. You can skim through it, see everything you want, configure it exactly as you want. Anything that you don't set, it'll set to default. And there, and there's lots. So you get the idea. Um, and this is only true for some. If I look up, let's say, the AWS EBC uh, Terraform, this one, there's actually not a lot of arguments. This is all of them. So it depends on the, on the actual resource and what the resource can actually do will depend on what, what parameters are given to you. Cool. So we've now run through this. You've sort of seen what Terraform looks like. So let's actually see what it looks like to use Terraform. So I've written all that Terraform. It's right here. This is that same Terraform. Main, yeah. See? No, no, no trick search or trick, trick sort of thing. It is the real same Terraform. Um, the other thing I'll show you guys really quick, since I realized I forgot to do that, is the output file. I'm going to have it output the IP address of the Docker server so that we can actually connect to it and make sure it really does work and that we're not making this all up. OK. So, now we're going to run Terraform Plan. Terraform Plan is the dry run for Terraform. So, all it will do is reach out to Amazon using my credentials and see what it's going to go build and in what order. And it will output what that's going to be. So, in this case, it's outputting I need to build a security gateway, I need to build a browse, here's the internet gateway, here's the server. And anything it doesn't know, or knows it's going to get filled in later, like, for example, the host ID, it's going to tell you known after apply. Can you make the font bigger? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I can do that. Thanks. Okay, so here we go. How's that? Better? Yeah. So, like, a good example is, this is building out a Docker server. Uh, the host ID won't be known until after we actually apply it, because it's generated by Amazon in real time. So it'll tell you, hey, I don't know the answer to that. It will be. But it does know that it's going to set these tags, because I told it to set these tags. So it will. Um, and so forth. So this is sort of really quick dry run. You can add a glance, scroll through it slowly, make sure it's all correct, because once you hit apply, it will do whatever you tell it to. Um, what's nice about this is since we're not, we don't have anything right now, it's just going to add nine things, because it knows that's what it needs to do. It's not going to change anything, it's not going to destroy anything, it doesn't care. So let's go ahead and actually go run that. So when you run Terraform Apply, it's going to refresh again, because it wants to make sure that since when you ran Plan and you ran Apply, nothing has changed, it will then output it for you again. This allows you to verify twice. Now, if you put this into a pipeline, that's really annoying. So there is an auto-approve flag you can give it, and it will just run on its own. But it's always nice to have the output when you're doing it manually. And then you tell them whether or not you're going to perform the actions. Yes? Yes, I am. So now we're going to sit here and wait and imagine all the time it takes to build all of those things that we're building. And it's going to take forever and forever. But it really doesn't because Terraform is incredibly fast. So we've already built all the VPCs, we've built all the subnets, we've built all the gateways, and we've run into an error. <laughs> Interesting. 
I would run into a weird air. <laughs> don't, don't do this in front of other people. <laughs> <laughs> Promise it does really work. I'm not making it up. There we go. And then it'll finish. And now we have working Terraform. We built all those things, and it's outputted the IP address. And now we find out if it works, which I think it's not going to because I don't think that was the right input for the gateway. It was not. So we're going to cheat. I want to see what, what it's supposed to affect. Put the right put the right parameter value in it, and it works fine every time. Uh, let's see, fake. Here it is. Here's the round table. Here's the rounds. That's not the right round. I swear the round is supposed to be this, so I don't know why. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something interesting. So server really does work. I have a working server. It's all up and running. It literally was built a minute ago. Not spoken mirrors. This is how easy it is. And what's where this is really cool about this is that we built one server today. You could easily change the instance count in Terraform, and it will build. Let me do that really quick. So now what I can do is do count equals. Five, and I'm going to do that, and then I can simply run Terraform again. Terraform plan. And now I'm looking like a terrible person who has never done this before. <laughs> Promise this is not my first time. Oh, it's because I. It's because of this. My bad. Oh, but really, that works. Should I remove that now? Now it's back. So, the long story short, the reason it aired. Just so everyone's aware, at least it gives you somewhat reusable errors. The reason it aired is because I told it to output it, the IP address for that server, and now it's like, okay, well, but now you have really like five of them, so I don't know what to do. So you have to actually tell it to output which, which specific server. But what's nice is what you'll notice is now it's outputting to build four more servers. It's not going to build more VPCs, it's not going to build more gateways, it's not going to build more routes, it's not going to do anything else. All it's going to do build a bunch more servers for you, because that's all you need. And it knows you have one, so it's gonna just build what else you need. And this is sort of where like Terraform is unique, is that you can just keep adding on to your code and making further changes to it as needed to build what you want. So let's say if I don't need a, a dev Docker server and I need to build myself a MySQL server too, I can do MySQL and, and I can give it the MySQL name give it a different instance size, maybe, and then run my Terraform, and it will go and build out that server. So this is the point, is now I can very quickly build out servers. It's really easy to copy and paste. Once you get the initial stuff built up, it will pop out and just sort of, okay, well, here's my MySQL server. So once I hit apply, I'll have another server, and I'll have it down. And that is all I have on Terraform. Questions?
So you showed spinning up a server and adding more on top of it and just handling the delta for that. Um, if you wanted to change VPC settings or SGs or some of those other properties, um, can you do that globally in a way where it, it actually just mutates them across the servers without redestroying them and stuff? Yes. Um, so the trick with that is it depends on the particular thing you're changing. If you're changing a security group, let's say I change the security group in here, it will do an in-place change. So it'll pull out the old security group, it'll drop in the new one, you'll be up and running, it will not impact your service at all. With that said, if you change something like a VPC, there's no way for Terraform to move the VM to the other VPC. Um, even if Amazon supports it, Terraform doesn't understand that. Mm -hmm. So it will tear it down and build out a new one. So it depends on what you're changing. For things like tags, which is the easiest one to show you, if I add another tag, it'll just in place and put another tag on place, good to go. I'm in the same security groups. Same with like turning on a public IP if there isn't already one, it'll turn that on for you and just hand you in a public IP. So it, it does depend on the setting. Um, but if you do things like change the whole IP range it's assigned to or such, like because it doesn't know how to fix that on the fly, it will just be like, yeah, screw it. You give you a new server. Um, this is also why we tell you when you build out with Terraform, like treat Terraform as your only infrastructure management so that you can have you can so you can have Terraform in here. We can add an extra section called provisioners, and we can have it do call out to Chef, call out to Ansible, call out to whatever. And the whole idea here is now you treat your infrastructure as cattle instead of as you know pets, and you can have it if it does tear it down, go rebuild it, go run your Ansible automatically, and go get your server back up and running how you expect it. So basically, the idea is uh, as as long as you've got some kind of underlying automation for. Making those servers, this can be used to move across different types. Uh, you can change these properties and not worry about how it gets there to doing it. Exactly. Okay. Oh. Um, so one of the big selling points you brought up uh, initially um, is that this is sort of intended to be a, a language that's agnostic to your cloud provider. Sure. Um, and then, uh, but. Uh, um, as you're talking about like your resources here that you can define, they have a type that is you know AWS or whatnot. Sure. Are there modules or good practices for writing your actual um, manifests in a way that are agnostic to cloud providers as well, so they can be kind of changed out if you were to switch? This is an interesting question. Um, as a company, we we get asked that a lot. I get asked that by both open source users, just like you guys, along with Fortune 500s. So it's a very serious question. There isn't a good answer for you um, as of today in Terraform. There is talks of different ways to solve for this sort of in the future um, to make it more agnostic like you want. But right now, you can't really nest modules in a way that makes it do what you want it to do. Um, so the short answer is today, no. In the future, probably, but I don't know when. Okay, thanks. May I ask a Packer-related question? Sure. Um, so first, to make sure that I'm understanding correctly, Packer doesn't truly build the image. It relies on plugins to help run the native OS installer to create right. that image. And then it, it manipulates that image afterwards, appropriate for whatever Correct. environment. So what kind of issues have you seen with that where like essentially you have to do cleanup where maybe that image wasn't truly built in that original environment that it needs to run in. For example, if you build an Im image on KVM and thinking about how the kernel recognizes the environment and does certain things, sure. but then you're gonna move it to Amazon where it might be running on Zen or something like that. So, interesting question. Uh, a lot of times when I've seen people using, so I'm, I'm actually gonna go back a little bit. When I worked at Rackspace, one of my projects actually was Packer. Um, what we were trying to do was build out a solution for exactly what you just described. Um, and we actually called that solution Zodiac. Zodiac wrapped Packer. Because the reality is Packer is very much designed to just be a layer to take an, an output. That's all it does. And the problem with it is exactly what you're talking about. Well, so if I'm working in KVM and now I'm going to end up in Zen, I might have problems with it. So what we found is that what we did at Backspace is we actually built a third layer, or our own sort of layer, and what it would do is pull ISO images directly from the, from the whatever provider sent to us, a bunch of whoever, and we would use those ISO images, push them through Packer, 
with the explicit intention for them to be used wherever we want them to be used. So let's say I'm pushing this image will be for VMware, this image will be for um, Google or, or, or Amazon, this one's like a VM image, like it would actually run each one of those runs through Packer separately so that the outputted image were exactly what we're expecting or whatever in the location it's going to. Instead of trying to transition from like a KVM to a, a ZIN, we would just use the ISO and, and, and explicitly create them for that purpose up front. And what we ended up, and the reason why we built sort of a tool for it is that it allowed us to build sort of like a, what we call the map, but essentially a template file that said, here's all the things that have to be changed at the OS level across the board, sort of standard across all these images, and then Packer at least understood the final output needs to be in these languages. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, so do you think it would be worthwhile or helpful if there was um, a way to build the OS image without running the installer, such that the file system, all the packages are put in place, boot was set up properly, but it had never been instantiated, so that kernel had never been run yeah, yet? I think that would be really useful. Okay. And I will tell you honestly, Packer does not do that today, but if it did, it would be really cool. Okay. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Absolutely.